today I'm talking to Jeremy Gilbert, who is Professor of Cultural Theory at the University of East London, and he's an old friend of mine. We've known each other for over 20 years easily. Jeremy, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm, I'm all right, yeah. I'm, I'm, it's, I've, I've wanted to get you on this and talk to you about things because... So for those who don't know, Jeremy um, writes mainly about politics, but from a cultural studies perspective, which means that politics isn't just what politicians talk about. It's, it's, uh, it's to do with the whole kind of cultural formation and movement and ideologies and passions and investment and interest. Um, and um, so he doesn't write about martial arts, but we've had a shared interest in things like yoga and Tai Chi for many years, haven't we? We, um, we So have, we've got yeah. conferences and themes were like stuff about politics, stuff about cultural studies, but we would spend many hours around the conference talking about Tai Chi and yoga and hippies and martial arts and it, you got me into yoga actually. <laughs> Good, I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> so tell us first then, let's talk first because this is the martial arts studies podcast so let's talk first about martial arts so you tell me about tai chi is the main thing that you've done right yeah tai, i mean tai i mean apart from some like tai do when i was 10 i did i mean i did tai chi i'm not practicing tai chi regularly now i haven't really been able to train since i had kids um but yeah, for, a, for for several years in my late twenties, nearly thirties, I was training Tai Chi several times a week, sort of practicing every day, and I still try to keep up a sort of form practice and a Qigong practice at least like once a week, um, alongside yoga, and yeah, that's very. I mean, that's about. I mean, that's it. Is Wu style Tai Chi that I trained at the um at the academy in London, which is a pretty serious. I mean, it's a pretty serious place. Yeah you know that was one of the few places it's one of the, it still is probably i presume one of the few places in london or in the, the uk really where you can really you can go train several times a week and you know, you've got yeah. people who are really following the classic training program for tai chi of you know which is really sort of several hours a day yeah of course people will know i mean people will know listening to this i'm sure that you know tai chi is really i mean to do tai chi sort of quote unquote properly you know, it's pretty it's pretty demanding it's you know it's it's, it's quite time heavy <laughs> yeah <laughs> and it's not just like train a few times a week it's like okay so to do this properly you're getting mm -hmm. up when it's still dark and yeah you're going to train and it has to be every single day otherwise yeah. you're a failure and a loser i mean my line on is it is they'll tell you you've got to do at least half an hour a day and they're just lying to you <laughs> you just actually, at some point within the cycle of a pra of training you know after a couple of years you realize it's not it's like two to three hours a day yeah really and um and it, you know it's very rewarding but it's pretty pretty serious commitment but then so is yoga if you're doing that properly as well which like very few people do yeah it's best to not do things properly i think Probably is better to <laughs> for be reasons of efficiency <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so uh, now if if memory serves me well, so we both of us um, have written about different forms of cultural theory and used to, and you've got a new book out called Hegemony Now from Verso, which is very much about global political movements and and who is in control and how might you know how might we have any political agency and what kind of, but we that seems a world away from Tai Chi and yoga and martial arts, but. I think in about 2001, Zizek, Zizek's book came out on belief, and that's where Slavoj Zizek, the Slovenian Marxist philosopher and psychoanalyst, started to basically claim, argue that those, so people like us who were really into things like Tai Chi and yoga were basically exemplary ideological subjects because his argument is that neoliberal ideology at that time demanded that practices like this rise in ascendancy and rise to the fore because they help you to function ideologically now we talked a lot about this at the time i mean what what is your position on on that kind of argument that this sort of stuff is ideological i mean how well i think you know i'm not a big fan of zizek as you know hmm. but um 
I would also say, you know, it would be dis- it would be totally disingenuous to say that one didn't know what he was talking about because there was. I mean, that book, as you say, it came out about twenty years ago, and I remember. Oh, hang on, I've got a delivery. I've got to take. All right. Yeah. Let's pause for a second. I'll pause this, yeah. No one else eats. Back. Okay, you got your delivery. That's good. <laughs> so is Zizek. So Zizek, um, I mean, Zizek had a point. If Because I remember around that time in the early 2000s, I remember visiting uh, friends in, in San Francisco. And, and it really was kind of extraordinary how ubiquitous both sort of Buddhist and Taoist uh, sort of imagery was and sort of Taoist derived. I remember meeting, you know, there was at least one person I met who had to tell you, was just an, an academic, a PhD student, who seemed pretty straight, but she had a like Chinese characters tattoo, which she said, red don't cling, which was that great kind of Taoist um, uh, sort of, um, that sort of Taoist uh, derived slogan. And I remember you writing an essay actually about that, that don't eat my who took my cheese oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> who moved my cheese yeah. who moved my cheese and it's i mean there was a real kind of there was a big movement in sort of very pro-capitalist sort of ideology coming out of things like management theory for example which was trying to borrow certain tropes uh, from Taoism in particular at the time you know, the idea of of letting go, of not clinging, of accepting change and changeability, so going with the flow. It was basically valorising the idea that people should just make themselves completely malleable, completely adaptive to their jobs, completely adaptive to the market. You know, people shouldn't want to have, like, a stable career, a stable home life, a predictable life course, like the various things that sociologists like Richard Sennett were pointing out were being taken away from people, you know, violently by... The forms of capitalism that people like Thatcher and Reagan and then Blair and Clinton had all sort of endorsed and, and promoted. So, and I think um, I think Zizek really had a point uh, that clearly there was a fairly, you know, there was a sort of appropriation of those things. Of course, the trouble with Zizek's analysis was, from our point of view at least, is he had no interest at all in the question of whether or not these forms of kind of capitalist appropriation of Taoism and Buddhism were doing some kind of violence to the things they were appropriating. Like he, he wasn't interested in that at all. And to the extent that he took any interest in that question, he basically implied that there was a kind of natural organic fit between, you know, something called Taoism or something called Buddhism, you know, Western, what he, he referred to Western Buddhism and sort of capitalist ideology. And, Certainly, I mean, it's interesting to, to 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 note, I think, in the intervening period, like especially within, say, American Buddhism, there has been huge pushback against that. There's been a huge pushback within sort of organized Buddhism against tendencies like the sort of appropriation of mindfulness by big corporations and the sort of neoliberalization of those philosophies. And I think you can say, certainly in the case of Buddhism, I think you can say it is only possible to create this sort of capitalist versions of those things, which just train you to adapt to a horrible working life. Uh, it's only possible to do that by doing real violence to the intentions of, of the tradition and the kind of the, the social and political implications of the tradition. Taoism is a bit trickier because Taoism, you know, is a much more elusive sort of tradition and it's one that doesn't really, I mean, arguably it's a tradition of practice rather than a, a philosophy. Um, and you can sort of adapt those, I mean, those practices are by their nature sort of adaptive. But then, you know, the sort of, I mean, I've written about some of these issues, not so much in academic work, but in like, you know, in sort of political writing and commentary since uh, yeah, I wrote quite a lot about some of this stuff in sort of 2017, 2018. And my argument is, has always been, well, even if it's true that people who, you know, I would regard, I and Zizek would regard as political enemies can appropriate uh, things from those traditions, techniques, practices, and ideas. That doesn't mean that's the only thing that can be done with them. And the, the correct response from my point of view is not to do what Zizek does and say, oh, well, because because Silicon Valley, because the Silicon Valley moguls are into Buddhism, I, now I'm into being a Catholic or something. Um, you know, it's more appropriate, I think, it's more useful to say, okay, well, we should reappropriate them. You know, we should take them back. You know, we should think about, well, if you want to be engaged in a practice, 
of that nature? How do you avoid it becoming something which is simply indeed making you a more profitable work, an easily exploitable worker yeah. and a more compliant subject of a, a highly exploitative forms of capitalism? Because I think it's a fair point from people like Zizek that if you don't have a plan to avoid that being what will happen with those things, then it quite likely will. I mean, it's true that we, we've we now seen, you know, we're now living in a world where in many sectors of the economy, you know, your employers will be perfectly happy if you're like spending loads of time and energy meditating or training some kind of, you know, Asian physical culture, um, because it'll make you a better worker. You know, they'll, they'll encourage you, they'll help you. They'll, if you're really lucky, they might pay for some of your classes. But um, and if you if you but and if you're if you don't want that to be what's happening to your practice, then you do have to be conscious about it. You have to think, well, how do I avoid that? And then there's a whole set of questions, which in this country you haven't really been thought about at all. But in the States, actually, in the States, certainly around Buddhist in the sort of Buddhist tradition and in yoga, actually, there's a lot of people now who who've put a lot of effort into sort of resisting that, those ideas, <clears throat> into resisting the criticisms that have been made that accuse you know any kind of you know any westerner engaged in an asian practice of orientalism or racism and you know there's a big kind of decolonizing yoga movement i'm not sure i don't think it really knows what it is that it wants to achieve but you know it's but it's quite different from that moment of 20 years ago actually so there has there has been it's it's not just kind of sort of speculative theory on my part that you could have like a politicized version of those things which is deliberately avoiding those forms of appropriation i mean that is what's happening especially in the states partly just because the political climate has changed so much so i think gijek did raise yeah you know, he did raise some some interesting points and he, you know but as usual i mean you know my slogan about gijek he's always asking we are asking all the right questions and he's always getting all the wrong answers you know his answer to oh what do we do about the fact that like you know silicon valley billionaires are into meditation and now what do we do about it oh we become we should become like catholic stalinists yeah. uh, no that's not the right answer it's the right question it's the wrong answer <laughs> yeah i think that's very true um th there's also um because at around that time and so you you saw this happening in in san francisco and chizek was writing about it and i did um a little bit of research into new martial arts stories in the British press and around 2000 so from 99 to about 2001 2002 there was a large increase in the number of stories about tai chi and yoga in yeah. mainstream press so like in the daily mail even yeah. even in the guardian in the times um and it and it wasn't it was rarely about efficiency at work it was more about <laughs> <laughs> well a lot of it was for like exercise that women should do yeah but, and, and, and for old people and so on but yeah, but it was, it was it, this is not this is not straightforward mm. ideological kind of uh, appropriation of a practice almost like it's spilled over from its if she's got any any point at all it spills out of that and it becomes other things anyway uh, I mean, what do you think about that, that extra, that, that, you know, Tai Chi, if it's flowing around the mainstream, these areas of, of, of high power, um, it, it goes to other places and becomes other things, right? I mean, does, it, it, does you have, do you have to, have to have a necessary kind of critical take on it in order to save it from becoming a bad thing? Or... No, I don't, no, it's just if you're bothered about it. I mean, the, there's, just, there's two separate questions there. One is, should you even be bothered? Yeah. If like uh, those practices are are are, become, are mutating into something that is helping people adapt to you rather than challenge sort of capitalist exploitation, and my and I would tend to say, well, maybe, you know, my perspective is sometimes, yeah, sometimes I would be bothered about it. You know, at other times I would say, well, you know, if people need things to help them adapt, it's better that people are doing tai chi than you know taking loads of antidepressants or something. So, um, but also it's not you know that depends on your sort of political orientation and i, I can't i don't have a, an argument that i can make you know for listeners of, of this show that would tell people why they that they should be bothered about that so if you're not bothered about that then fine but zizek was writing for an audience of people who were assumed to be bothered about that hmm. issue and you know i'm i mean he's you know i'm sort of bothered about it under certain circumstances but hmm. 
I don't think I think the question of whether you want to sort of preserve the authenticity of the practice of a practice is always really is always sort of really tendentious and again it, it just the, the there isn't one straightforward answer I mean the answer is well it depends what you want what outcomes you want so if the outcome you want is for these practices to diff, to be diffused to be available to lots of people to keep to develop in in various ways then the no um if you think there's a risk of something important being lost if so, if at least some people don't sort of preserve a kind of fairly rigorous tradition of practice then then there are reasons to be concerned but yeah. i think there's certainly no um you know there's obviously there's nothing to be sort of regretted about a broad ecology cultural ecology within which yeah you might have you might well have people using these things very casually for all sorts of purposes and you've got other people who are committed to a fairly orthodox tradition of of practice uh i don't there's not there's, there's certainly nothing wrong with that sort of an ecology i would say on a slightly more sort of profound philosophical level i think you know it is qu quite significant that most of the east asian sort of con contemplative traditions that all of these physical pra practices have some historic relationship to have a pretty specific set of objectives in terms of what they are trying to um, facilitate in their practitioners and what they're trying to facilitate is really a sort of um as a kind of emancipation from from the whole idea of sort of individual selfhood and and i think there is there is something quite specific going on when under particular historic conditions they become sort of the opposite they become ways not ways of people sort of losing themselves or escaping themselves quite deliberately but ways of people sort of reinforcing a sense of self and a sense of kind of individual selfhood and under those circumstances, I think under those conditions, I think there is something to ask questions about. You know, there is something to be a bit concerned about. Um, but I think, I don't really think that, I wouldn't say, for example, that has really been a big issue with uh, martial arts. I'd say it's been a, it's a much bigger issue in the way in which yoga has been practiced. And, and the most striking example would be sort of mindfulness. I mean, mindfulness you know, is, a, is a meditative practice which comes straight out of a tradition and the whole point of that tradition is you're supposed to reach a point of realization that the whole notion of you or any other entity in the universe having a kind of autonomous exist a private existence is illusory that's the point of it and in, and the te but the techniques have been completely abstracted from the monastic tr tr practice traditions in which those that objective is pursued and they've been retooled to be a sort of casual form of meditation whose purpose is really to just enable people to you know build up their ego defenses in psychological terms against against kind of various kinds of everyday trauma and kind of casual stress which is really the opposite i mean it's literally it's philosophically and practically the opposite of what those things were supposed to be achieving and under those circumstances i think you can say yeah there is something politically quite problematic happening you know we're being you know people the, the whole point of these things is to stop you being a sort of bourgeois subject and instead they're being used to completely reinforce people's status as a bourgeois subject but i don't really i mean i don't think you know based on my sort of casual observations i don't think that's really something that's happened a lot in martial arts culture partly partly because martial arts you can't because you can't do martial arts on your own it can't be turned into like a, a wholly privatized practice so people doing martial arts have to have some kind of a community of practice and there has to be some notion of a kind of collective practice so i don't think um i mean it's sort of interesting actually because the, the if you think about the way in which it's just it's even in forms of martial arts practice that don't have any sort of um explicit kind of contemplative dimension you know there's some there is some notion of that you know there's some notion of the, the the place where you go and train as an institution as a, and, a, and as a sort of loose community uh whereas things like sitting meditation um have been very have been almost completely detached from that you know people people don't people most people who do sitting meditation don't have any kind of relationship to a sort of community of other practitioners and that's something that i mean it's interesting because you've got text going back you know sort of several hundred years bce 
saying don't do that like if you do that <laughs> if you do that you're just gonna turn into more wanker you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> mm. <laughs> fabulous okay um so turning into a wanker okay so yeah, the next thing then that i definitely wanted to ask you about because i've heard you talk a little bit about this on on some other shows and other contexts is the the sort of relatively newish but 2010-ish notion or term conspirituality because i think that so so there's an argument in the con the original conspirituality theorists that mm -hmm. something strange happened after 9 11 which was connected to the birth of social media and hence disinformation and and the the, the loss of the referent and, and the inability to verify things in which dovetail together to to kind of um, produce a strange hybrid of, of, of spirituality in this kind of new age sense, Western new age spirituality, um, connecting in with conspiracy theory. So the obvious like gateway is through fear of pharmaceutical companies, fear of the state. Fear. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, what do you think about that kind of nexus? Is that as a kind as someone who does these kind of conjunctural analyses do you agree with that proposition first of all that there is a thing called conspirituality and we're susceptible to it if we're be believing in our purity and and doing our meditation and qigong and yoga and tai chi or is it more complicated than that well i think it's definitely a real phenomenon i mean there's the convergence between new age ideas and kind of conspiracy certain kinds of conspiracy theories for example over the past few years is 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 just self-evident mm -hmm. you can i mean lots of people listening will have friends who've made that journey from being just a sort of you know an everyday hippie you know probably fairly left wing to being kind of a right wing adjacent conspiracy the anti-vaccine conspiracy theory i mean it's a real phenomenon i think um, it's, I mean, it's interesting to think about, yeah, it, does it, you know, I mean, the first thing to say, I mean, it's interesting to think about this question, does it, is there something in those practices and traditions that make them, make their practitioners particularly vulnerable to that kind of thinking? Um, I would tend to say, I'm not sure there is, because there are lots of versions of those kind of mad conspiracy theories that are linked to forms of Christianity, you know, other forms of religion, they're linked to forms of, you know, there are some that are linked to like anti-Semitism, anti a kind of eugenicist race theory, you know, they're sort of linked to all sorts of things. So I think if there's anything that we've learned from that history over the past 10 years or so, it's more just that, well, you know, being into something like yoga doesn't inoculate you against being a sort of conspiracy theorist in a way that possibly you know like being a good marxist might inoculate you against it because it gives you a kind of social theory and i suppose i mean as a sort of uh, observation there i mean it's definitely true i would say over the past one of the things that i would say about that kind of new age scene and also adjacent cultural scenes like the psychedelic scene which has grown kind of hugely over the past 30 years is there is a real kind of tendency within all of those scenes for people to want to sort of derive uh, our theories of society and historical change from completely inappropriate sort of intellectual resources um you know it's something i've really noticed in um you know, I've paid quite a lot. I've paid quite a lot of attention to the so-called the sort of psychedelic renaissance because it's such an interesting phenomenon. I think it's really one of the typical features of contemporary culture. Again, especially in the states, but it's clearly manifested in Europe, and including Britain as well. You know, because people. I mean, the, you think about the huge. I mean, you know, how normalised it is now in lots of social circles for people to do ayahuasca or people to grow mushrooms and all this kind of thing, and. You know, there's a real tendency for people in those kind of scenes to want to build whole sorts of theories or whole whole sorts of theories of how society works and how historical change works just out of like their tripping experiences or sort of observations they've made or or, the, or just a weird mishmash of bits of new age philosophy, bits of indigenous philosophy they've picked up on an ayahuasca retreat, you know, bit 
and not just to ask themselves well is this actually a pro look if, if i want a theory of like how capitalism works maybe i should go read some like economics and social theory like maybe maybe you can't build a whole theory of society just from this particular set of resources as interesting as they might be for thinking about other things and to some extent i would attribute that to the fact that you know the and this is something we talk about in the new book hegemony now you know the broad context for all this stuff is the sort of rise of silicon valley you know as the most powerful section of of capitalism like in the world and, and like the most powerful the the most important locus of real power globally in the world silicon valley and of course part of the sort of organic ideology of silicon valley and it's and many of the people working there and organizing things there is this sort of assumption that the things they've learned as coders and as people running, you know, doing venture capital investment could be applied to all kinds of other sort of social problems. You know, they, they really think they should be running schools. They, they could solve climate change. They, they should probably replace the government because, because they, because they've built these big platforms, you know, that's, and, and this idea that there's basically, you, you just need this, this handful of specialized skills to understand sort of everything it is it is part of their ideology i mean arguably it's part of every social group every powerful social group's ideology i mean you know bankers have always thought that because they were bankers they should run everything and everything should be run like a bank i mean you know probably you know probably you know probably you know fishermen probably think that about fish you know fishing or <laughs> so to some extent everybody thinks like that but but i think it is really striking is really notable and it is also, I would say, just a symptom of the until very recent, you know, you've got to remember it's you know, up until about 2015, you know, the political left had just been sort of off the map culturally since since the late 80s. Like it just wasn't something most people had any sort of contact with. And I would say, you know, in really crude terms, I mean, I'd say, I'm not saying don't do ayahuasca. I'm not saying, you know, don't do psychedelics to, to get some kind of, you know, introspective insights. I'm, and I'm, I'm definitely not saying don't do sort of yoga or uh, meditation and martial arts to sort of cultivate certain capacities in yourself. But I am saying none of those things are going to tell you like how the economy works. Like if you want to understand how the economy works, go read Marx. Like that's that's what you should do. Um uh, you know similarly you know marx isn't really going to tell you much about how you know how, how, how your body works and how it, your body relates to your brain your mind and you want to go you know do some martial arts or something if you want to understand those things better so um but i think a lot an awful lot of this conspirituality phenomenon to me it does it seems like it's people just grappling around for explanations of things they can see going on in the world like you know the concentrated power of corporations like the the real kind of spread of you know disinformation and the kind of breakdown of any sense of a consensual reality but they just don't have intellectual or analytical tools with which with which to make sense of it and it's not even part of their education and experience the idea that you might go look for those tools like somewhere else other than where you happen to be at the moment yeah. uh, so instead what people do is they just is they go and you know they just they just try to put together this whole architecture this intellectual architecture which can explain things like you know the everything from the you know the 2008 financial crisis to the pandemic mm -hmm. on the basis of really limited forms of knowledge mm -hmm. i think there is there is something about uh some sort of new age ideas and some sort of east asian derived ideas there is something about some of those traditions which i think can lend people a certain kind of um a certain tend a certain openness to conspiratorial thinking and that is partly the, the way in which some of those traditions not all of them but some of them make kind of epistemological call claims they make claims to grant their practitioners access to forms of knowledge which are in some sense uh superior to those of ordinary which ordinary people have on the basis of their ordinary perceptions um and I think that's quite problematic. Uh, a lot of the time, I think, honestly, that's based on really kind of crude you know, translations of those traditions, you know, in the Buddhist and in, in the Vedic like Indian traditions that, you know, there are these currents of thinking which say, they say, oh, well, phenomenal reality, like everyday experience reality is an illusion. And, you know, and behind that illusion is just the kind of undifferentiated energy of the cosmos or, or God or, or just the emptiness of... 
Buddhist doctrine. And for the most part, I think those are, I mean, to be honest, those ideas are just really, they've been really crappily translated since the 19th century in the late 18th century. And like, you know, they're not really saying everything is an illusion. What they're really saying is something which just ordinary physics tells us today, which is, well, on a certain scale, you know, every even solid objects are made up of, you know, constantly mobile particles. And on another scale, you know, everything is made up of the same, you know, collections of like quarks bouncing off each other and stuff. And that's interesting. And it's very, and it is really interesting and impressive that people just sort of meditating 2000 years ago could come up with that observation, which has been sort of pretty much validated by, you know, contemporary physics. But um, it's not really, it's not really saying that those things are illusory and the and you know the and the claim that that, that, that what it's saying is that the ph phenomenal world is sort of unreal i mean that's mostly like i said i think it's based on a really kind of um, bad translation tradition that's, that goes back to the 19th century and but nonetheless um the way in which those things have been picked up and translated and often sold to sort of western audiences and practitioners uh, for more than 100 years now is that they are often claiming to offer those practitioners um, some kind of profound insight into the true nature of cosmic reality, which can pierce beyond behind the veil of ordinary phenomenal illusion. And if you sort of got yourself into that headspace where you think like because you sort of meditate for an hour a day and do yoga, then somehow, you know, that sort of... Um, that kind of you know dopamine saturated glow that you get from from doing those things is somehow telling you that, that is somehow you experiencing the truth of the co the cosmic reality and yeah. everything that doesn't everything ordinary all the ordinary stuff around you yeah your desk your computer your friend yeah, your partner that doesn't you know doesn't have that sort of dopamine saturated glow all the time is therefore is sort of unreal yeah. then i think you are kind of open to being to being told by other people that they have some sort of secret knowledge about the way the world really works that they're going to impart to you um including you know the secret knowledge that you know there, there wasn't really that covid19 was all fake or you know that um there are these weird networks of there are these power elites who are really lizard people who are you know who are, who are running the world or whatever so um, and I think that does speak a little bit to the sort of dangers which which might be inherent in really casual kind of reappropriations of some of those traditions and and just a really a kind of weak a sort of unrigorous uh, translate you know translations of both ideas and practices into different contexts. So I think there is something there. Um, uh, yeah, so I definitely, yeah, I think there is, I think there is something there actually. But I mean, for me, the the thing, the 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 biggest cause of it all, the worst symptom is, as I've said already, is simply the fact that, well, you know, there's a lot of people who are very intelligent, and you know, they'll get very involved in these kind of tr in things like new age, you know, not because they're stupid or naive, because but because they're very interesting and they're looking for something very interesting to do and think about, and despite the fact that they're very intelligent and um, they're, they're very capable of kind of thinking about big questions about the nature of power in the world. They're just completely, they've never in their lives been told even really that there are bodies of ideas and bodies of scholarship and ways of thinking about the world, which could illuminate those questions for them in a kind of, um, in a way that has you know, a, a high level of sort of validity. So, um, and I, so I think that's the, I think that's the biggest problem. And I think I think there is a re, I think it is really sort of regrettable that there isn't more dialogue between sort of things like social, social theory, political theory, critical theory, and some of the traditions and practices that we're talking about. But I don't. That's not really specific. It's not specific to martial arts. So like, not many people talk about like martial arts and Marxism because not many people talk about music and Marxism either. Like, not many people talk about food and Marxism either. It's not really specific mm. to those traditions. It's more to do with the fact that you know th the ideas which would give people a critical handle on the way in which power works in our society have been quite systematically excluded from most people's educational and sort of media ecologies for decades now. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, if you want a, a, an analogy, look, I mean, the, the, the rise of the kind of fundamentalist religious right is directly in, in America, for example, is a directly a consequence of 
the kind of McCarthyite and Cold War war on the left and the labor movement. So communities that had been kind of, you know, had lot, high levels of trade union organization, had high levels of orientation towards the left, even towards the communist left, you know, after a generation or two of those things just being wiped out, you know, ended up being full of people believing all kinds of mad shit, you know, from revelations in the Bible, because they were effectively allowed to believe that stuff, but not allowed to believe uh, the other stuff. You know, you can look at the way, I mean, the rise of Islamism, in the Middle East is a direct consequence of the all-out war on secular democratic you know, Arab nationalism. Why? Because it was too, which was you know prosecuted by Britain and America in the post-war period. Because Arab nationalism, secular Arab nationalism, was too closely allied with, uh, was too friendly towards the Soviet Union for the most part. So. If you if you go around like systematically destroying and suppressing like left wing ideas, then much madder ideas will will fill the, vo the the vacuum to take their place. And I think the conspirituality phenomenon I think is just one example of that. It's it's one localized example, and it's far from being the only one. Mm. So, which is, I mean, you <clears throat> have a lot of reservations about, say, like if we go back to Zizek. Because, um, I mean, you think that you're a world away from Zizek, but a lot of what you say is, it's like you say, all the right questions, all the wrong answers for, for Zizek. But, so you would always prefer a, a kind of Gramscian approach, because if, if we go Zizek and Marxist, crude Marxist analysis, then all of these people are ideological dupes and they're somehow just, you know, playing into the hands of a terrible capitalism. Zizek never articulates what's wrong with capitalism, by the way. Well, you know, but... Um, <laughs> But if you go Gramsci, which you often do, Gram you have a, a wonderful quote or paraphrase of Gramsci that you, you, often, you often repeat, which is, you know, when you look for these mass beliefs or new beliefs, it's not that they're simply ideological, but you, you look for the, what the Gramscian term would be like the, the good sense in the common sense, right? Like, like you, you, th there is every reason to I remember you talking about uh, on one episode of something I was talking about uh, Hillary Clinton and the kind of beliefs that were, were disseminated about Hillary Clinton in the run up to the to the uh, 2016 election um, when when you know the, the the theory that she's involved in all sorts of like children abuse and and all the rest of it but you can see you can re regard that as kind of symptomatic as a, it's like, as a consequence of kind of doing these calculations a little bit wrong but there's good sense in there somewhere yes you went yes. so far as to say that you do like that way of thinking about hillary clinton <laughs> well it's not wrong i mean it's not wrong that the clinton i mean the clintons are the kind of villains of a particular version of this right-wing conspiracy theory which i mean there's this you know the, the sort of pizzagate narrative like how ha has it that the Clintons are the absolute center of this kind of net network of liberal cap corporate actors around the world who've perpetrated all kinds of crimes, like you know uh, the sort of um, you know the entirely fictitious sort of you know child you know child sex ring that was supposed to be operating out of that pizza some pizza restaurant, um, mm. which then in some versions became a, 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 a of the story became them actually trafficking children to be sacrificed in like weird you know rituals or whatever um and yeah the actual literal um yeah the literal claims there are obviously mad nonsense but yeah it's not wrong that the clintons were absolutely central to the sort of formation of a global political class really yeah. which has been absolutely committed to imposing free market economics for example on the developing world uh, at the cost of millions of lives um including the lives of many children yeah. you know that was absolutely central to inequality in places like the united states and, and united kingdom growing and intensifying over decades you know after several decades during which it had narrowed yeah. Um, again, with terrible consequences for the quality of life and the life expectancy of poor people, including children. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, I think, I mean, it's, I'm talking more about Bill than Hillary here, but she was all, always complicit. But, you know, I, I re firmly believe that if humanity survives the next century, 
then Bill Clinton is going to be one of the most reviled figures of the late 20th century. Because if there's one moment you can point to and say, we had all the facts about climate change and could have done something about it, but instead they decided to go in completely the opposite direction, like destroying the post-war international regulatory frameworks and replacing them with absolutely imposing a lack of regulation on international business and commerce on uh, on on even on developing world countries i mean that is what the world trade organization did that is what the clinton administration did in between 94 and mm -hmm. 2000 um you know they they did they dis they deliberately destroyed the frameworks of international law and economic regulation which could quite easily have mitigated and started to reverse climate change and didn't and they didn't and they had all the facts everybody knew what was happening so i clinton I, I am quite sure clinton is going if if humanity survives at all he's going to be looked back on as one of the absolute villains of the second half of the 20th century so people coming up with weird conspiracy theories about bill clinton they might be wrong about the details but they're not wrong about the general observation that clinton is an absolute villain and um uh, and so I and so there is a grain of good sense there. And ge and generally speaking, you know, people aren't wrong that pharmaceutical companies are evil institutions. Yeah, they're not wrong. You know, they they might be wrong. They're wrong that the COVID vaccines don't work and are just a, you know tools of mind control. They're absolutely not wrong that those companies don't do anything, including COVID, producing COVID vaccines for anybody's benefit, except the benefit of their own shareholders, you know, and that they, and that they, you know, and that their pursuit of their, their own profits has cost millions of lives around the world in, you know, jacking up prices of necessary drugs for people, like way beyond what was necessary to, um, to, you know, research and produce them and even to make, you know, to pay the people producing and distributing them. So, um, so yeah, absolutely. In, in Gramscian terms, yeah, there is absolutely a, a grain of com a good sense in in all of those ideas, and it's one reason, that, of course, it's so difficult to con con to contest them because, you know, for the most part, those people who believe things like believing that the uh, pharmaceutical companies are trying to control all our minds with the COVID vaccine, uh, th what they're hearing from other sort of media outlets, they're not hearing. A kind of left critique which would say okay yeah those don't be ridiculous there is no such thing as mind controlling chemicals but you are right of course those companies are evil and what we should do about it is you know take them all into public ownership they're not hearing that they're just hearing they're hearing all the only alternative account they're hearing is one that says oh you're completely mad you're talking total nonsense those companies are good actually and their profit levels are necessary for because without them we wouldn't get the drugs in the first place which just anybody can see is nonsense like anybody could see like in 2020 it was complete nonsense that it was perfectly possible for them to carry out the necessary r d you know and the necessary manufacturing you know without you know having been engaged in a process of speculative you know of, of speculative investment and profit seeking like it was clearly possible so i mean really i think one can't blame those people for having uh, drawn the conclusions they have i think you know if anyone's to blame it's the media institutions which are which do largely act as the mouthpieces either of kind of a far right agenda which is pretty much the same as the anti-vaxxers anyway or of the people like the clintons yeah. you know and you just don't, you just don't hear that people don't often hear a very clearly articulated alternative um which would actually make sense of their own experience mm -hmm. so yeah, as you're speaking i mean there's so much I want to ask you further about what time is marching on. But uh, the, the thing that I guess I need to exercise somehow is the fact that I learned, I think yesterday or the day before yesterday, that Mark Zuckerberg is a, a huge MMA fan and practices uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu uh, and really? MMA and, and gets his people to, to train with him and to train. It's like, okay, so we've moved from mindfulness in the workplace to people at Facebook and Meta and Google falling in love with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And I wonder if there's some kind of shift there or if it's just a different iteration of the same kind of logic. Because I was worried about the things that I'm into from Tai Chi to 
Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. They always seem to be loved by people that I uh, worry about. I don't think that they kill or eat babies, but I think that um, they are part of this kind of Silicon Valley um, uh, hegemony that 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 you write about in your new book. I mean, is, is it just one of those things where things just move along and the new cool stuff comes and people get into it from microdosing this to having a bit of a meditation, meditate here to, to let's go and have a fight and you get the same kind of endorphin high and then you go back to work and go, yeah, I'm, I'm a real dude or something. I mean, it, it's, just, it's just that, it's just a physical thing. That well, I think, I think, I think, yeah, I think there's there's something to all that. Yeah, I mean, the first thing I would say is I don't think, you know, the fact that people we don't like are, are into something, I don't think should we necessarily put us off being into it. I it mean, puts me off a little bit from time to time. <laughs> well, I mean, my take on all that, that stuff is generally, you know, capitalists are, are for the most part not creative. You know, they're mostly just completely, um, completely parasitic, you know, for their ideas on... You know, whether it's people working in labs or people working at the sort of cultural fringe and yeah, you know, they'll they'll always they'll hoover up anything that's cool or anything that's got kind of energy about it that's what they'll do but i mean it's the real mistake for me made by people like zizek mm -hmm. is to think well that means there's something suspect about the stuff that they hoover up and appropriate like and my argument is always no they they appropriate it because it's attractive you know because it's got some intrinsic quality some intrinsic merit that's and that's what they want to suck out of it for themselves like the vampires that they are but you know <laughs> um so i think there is just you know there is something just sort of inherently to some extent there is something inherently fascinating about those things you know there's something really there's something interesting about there's something interesting about mma you know something interesting about the fact that well you have all these traditions of martial arts which are these sort of fascinating technologies um you know sort of technologies of the body you know, they're ways of you're training the body to do certain things that uh, without very high levels of training it can't possibly do but they're not you know they're sort of they're for the most part you know they've got pretty they seem to have pretty limited functionality in terms of their purported objectives you know they're not you know you can't there's very few people who've ever really been able to train you know in a lot of, in the, the classical martial arts to a level where they can demonstrably win a fight with someone who's a lot stronger than them just physically stronger i mean sadly that's that is just it that uh, that is empirically true and you know the project of mma is to kind of you know it, it, to to sort of inject you know to create a kind of mass research program into all these techniques and sort of figure out you know well, what could you do to what extent could you actually develop a set of te trainable techniques mm -hmm. which would enable people to sort of you know beat each other you know beat other people in a fight based on skill and training level rather than just mm -hmm. sheer you know, weight and strength that you know, that is just inherently interesting you know it, it might have all kinds of you know, there's, there's obviously and unsurprisingly really ugly features of MMA culture. I mean, it's complete. I mean, for the most part, it's pretty repulsive to me. You know, it's it, it mostly, you know, it is it's macho, it's violent, you know, it's all those things. But there is a sort of kernel of it, which is uh, sort, of, sort of fascinating. And it's not surprising to me that so many people have become fascinated with it, like especially in the States. It's not really surprising that people would become so fascinated with it and it, it would be a really interesting question like what would it mean you know what would it mean to try and take those techniques the kind of modern you know modern mma techniques and put them into a training tradition which like the sort of east asian training traditions is quite deliberately trying to you know civilize them in some sense or turn them into something which is more isn't just as kind of celebration of <coughs> you know macho thuggish power it would be an interesting question well, there, I mean, but, there is a there is research on that because I mean, you know, China has put up all different forms of blocks to MMA, and it's kind of you know it's kind of really put a lot of energy into developing its own full contact sporting yes. capacities in order to say this isn't MMA, this is Chinese, and it's Chinese sanda or it's 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 whatever form of boxing or wrestling or grappling they're doing. As a specific ideological nationalistic response. Yeah, sure. To, yeah, that's right. So yeah. MMA is pitched as universal, natural, scientific, you know, study of human athleticism. But in China, it's like, no, it's not. This is a turf war now. Um, so th these ideological responses are kind of 
much remarked in in kind of martial arts studies yeah well yeah that's very interesting well that's i mean it's not surprising at, at all either um yeah that is really interesting I mean, I mean, the converse is there obviously is a turn within a sections of that kind of Silicon Valley elite towards a kind of fairly reactionary, you know, sexual politics, for example. I mean, this is something that uh, Ben Little and Alison Winch have written about in their book recently about sort of digital patriarchy. The, the fact that there, well, that there, there clearly is, there is to some extent. There is a, there is, the, the, I think there is, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, I mean, the, you know, you can look at the notorious figures like Peter Thiel, but you can also look at the kind of, you know, ultra paternalism of a Bill Gates, and, you know, Zuckerberg does look like he's sort of drifting to the right on various issues. So, um, and again, that's not really surprising, to be honest. It's not really surprising that the kind of most senior figures in Silicon Valley are going to drift to the right on both social and sort of economic issues because that's where their interests are aligned. I mean, their interests, you know, they are, you know, they might 20 years ago have been sort of, you know, dynamic agents of, you know, a kind of technological re and cultural revolution of sorts. But now they are just the richest people in the world and they want to stay that way. And when you're one of when you're one of the richest people in the world and you're aiming to stay that way, you tend to develop reactionary and conservative perspectives on most issues. I mean, that's just a that is a historical norm which goes back like ten thousand years and is hardly ever challenged. So, so that's not really surprising. Um, and clearly, you know, a, a, a lot of the culture around MMA, you know, is bound up with a certain kind of male reaction to feminism and to, you know, changing gender norms and to, you know, it's people looking for a certain, you know, it's people looking for a sort of culture within which, you know, men, can, you know, men, men definitely, you know, can enjoy a kind of exclusive dominance. So that's part of it. It's not all of it by any means. It doesn't exhaust it, but clearly that's part of its appeal to... So people coming from the alt right, for example. I mean, I I, don't, I can't really comment with much authority on it because all the people I sort of know or or have any you know ever hear anything they say who are interested in MMA are, are more kind of. I mean, they're sort of people from the American millennial left, but there's like a big you know there's a lot of people associated with that and people who sort mm -hmm. of, you know, partly they're people who got um. You know, they were sort of fans of Joan Rogan, and then they got politicised by the Bernie Sanders campaign. And I mean, you know, a lot of those people are sort of quite into MMA. So I don't, I can't claim to know that much about it. Um, but I mean, I know that you know, I, there's a pretty broad spectrum of political opinion of people who are interested in it. So, but I think you know, as we say, MMA is clearly a good example of something which doesn't have, it just doesn't have a fixed organic, like a, an organic ideology. Like it, it's, it can be connected it could be plugged into a whole bunch of different sort of social machines and ideological apparatuses and the question of what the politics of mma might be is is depends entirely really on on the question of well, which you know what is it connected to like what is it it's not something that's inherent to it like it, the only thing that's inherent to it is a set of physical practices which you know could be put to all kinds of purposes yeah, I mean the the, the currents they, they all send you in a in a certain sporting direction. At the top of that sporting direction, you've got these you know these often quite right wing conservative you know people, and um, it's it's. But I mean, uh, there's a difference between you know playing a game of football on on a on a field and you put down some jumpers and they're the goalposts. But it's still kind of ideological. It's not necessarily ideologically aligned with FIFA or something like that, but because there's a lot of different stuff going on in that, but a, a lot of the force lines, I think, tend in that direction, even in some, so like say Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, which I do, it's not doesn't have to be connected with that ethos at all, but there are a lot of kind of, kind of um, attractions, a lot of pulls towards that MMA fighting competitive, perhaps macho um, direction. But yeah, it does not necessarily ideologically aligned thing so so like the club i train in there were it was just brazilian jiu-jitsu and they want to expand it and have more classes of different things and so they're going well it has to be kickboxing and mma and, and i was going hang on a minute why don't you do capoeira and yoga and tai chi <laughs> and they were like what? what what planet are you living on it's like well <laughs> you might get a wider range of people in 
you're like, no, the kickboxing will pull them into the to the BJJ, which will connect them to the MMA, and then we'll have a team, and then we'll go. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm not on message. I'm not on message. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, what we've talked for an hour, maybe. I think an hour is long enough. Do you think? I think so. Yeah. Much as I would, much as I would like to keep talking, but um, I, I, I'll, I'll. Mm close it there we'll stop now because that's a good amount of time but um maybe we'll we'll see what the reaction to this is i'm sure everyone will be everyone who listens to this will be like totally nodding in agreement with the marxism and (laughs) 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 Uh, introducing gramsci and marxism to martial arts studies that's job well done for the day i think okay great Uh, jeremy i'll stop recording and then we'll chat um thank you very much jeremy that was wonderful Yeah, thank you.